Heart of the World by H. Ryder Haggard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 The Legend of the Heart. When I had gone a few paces down the hole, it widened suddenly so that we were able to stand upright and light our candles. Now there was no doubt that we were in the tunnel of an old mine, a rudely dug shaft that turned this way and that as it followed the windings of the ore body. Along this tunnel we went for thirty or forty paces, creeping over the fallen boulders and twisting ourselves between the brown stalactites that in the course of ages had formed upon the roof and the floor, till presently we reached an obstacle that barred our further progress, a huge mass of rocks which at some time or other had fallen from the roof of the tunnel and blocked it. I looked at it and said, Now, Senor, I think we shall have to go back. You remember uh, the writing tells us that uh, this mine, although so rich, was unsafe because of the rottenness of the rock. Doubtless they propped it in the old days, but the timbers have decayed long ago. Yes, he answered. We can do nothing here without help, and Ignatio, I, I don't like the look of the roof. It is full of cracks. As these last words left his lips, a piece of stone the size of a child's head fell from above almost at his feet. Speak softly, I whispered. The ring of your voice is bringing down the roof. Then I stooped to pick up the fallen stone, thinking that it might show ore, and, as I did so, my hand touched something sharp, which I lifted and held to the candle. It was the jawbone of a man, yellow with age and corroded by damp. I showed it to the Signor, and kneeling down we examined the bed of the tunnel together, and not uselessly, for there we found the remainder of the skull and some fragments of an arm bone, but the rest of the skeleton lay under the great boulder in front of us. He was coming out of the mine when the rocks fell upon him, poor fellow, whispered the Signor. Look here, and he pointed to a little heap of something that gleamed in the candlelight. It was free gold, six or seven ounces of it, almost pure and for the most part in small nuggets that once were contained in a bag which had long since rotted away. Doubtless, after the mine was closed, some Aztec who knew its secret had made a practice of working there for his own benefit, till one day as he was coming out the rock fell upon him and crushed him, leaving his spirit to haunt the place forever. "'There is no doubt about this mine being rich,' whispered the Signor. "'But all the same, I think that we had better get out of it. "'I hear odd noises and rumblings which frighten me. "'Come, Ignatio.' "'And he turned to lead the way towards the opening. Two paces farther I saw him strike his ankle against a piece of rock "'that stood up some six or eight inches from the floor-bed of the tunnel, "'and the pain of the blow was so sharp that, forgetting where he was, "'he called out loudly.' The next instant there was a curious sound above me, as of something being torn, and, lo, I lay upon my face on the rock, and upon me rested a huge mass of stone. I say that it rested upon me, but that is not altogether true, for had it been so the stone would have killed me at once, uh, as a beetle is killed beneath the foot of a man, instead of taking more than two and twenty years to do it. The greater part of its weight was borne by a piece of rock against which the Signor had struck his leg, a point of the fallen boulder only pressing into my back and grinding me against the ground. Now we were in darkness, for the Signor had knocked down also, and his candle extinguished, and in the midst of my tortures it came into my mind that he must be dead. Presently, however, I heard a voice saying, Ignacio? Do you live, Ignacio? Now I thought for a moment. Even in my pain, I remembered that more of the roof would surely give ere long, and that if my friend stayed here, he must die with me. 
nothing could save me. I was doomed to a slow death beneath the stone. And yet if I told him this, I knew that he would not go. Therefore I answered as strongly as I could. Fly, senor, I am safe, and do but stay to light a candle, and I will follow you. You're lying to me, he answered. Your voice comes from the level of the floor. And, as he spoke, I heard the scratching sound of a match. So soon as he had found his candle and lit it, he knelt down and looked at me. Then he examined the roof above, and, following his glance with difficulty, I saw that next to the hole whence the boulder had fallen hung a huge block of stone that, surrounded by great cracks from which water dripped, trembled like a leaf whenever he moved or spoke. "'For the love of God, fly!' I whispered. "'In a few hours it will be over with me, and you cannot help me. "'I am a dead man. Do not stop here to share my fate.' For a moment he seemed to hesitate. Then his courage came back to him, and he answered hoarsely, "'We entered this place together, friend, and we will go out together, or not at all. "'You must be fixed by the rock, and not crushed, or you would not speak of living for hours. Let me look.' And he lay upon his breast and examined the fallen rock by the light of his candle. "'Thank God there is hope,' he said at last. "'The boulder rests on the ground, and above a, the stone against which I struck my leg, "'for only one point of it is fixed in your back. "'Do you think that anything is broken, Ignacio?' Oh, "'I cannot say, senor. My pain is great, and I am being slowly crushed to death, "'but I believe that as yet my bones are whole. "'Fly, I beg you. I will not,' he answered sullenly. "'I am going to roll this rock off you.' Then, lifting with all his great strength, he strove to move the stone, but without avail, for it was beyond the power of mortal man to stir it, and all the while the black mass trembled above his head. "'I must go for help,' he said presently. "'Yes, yes, senor,' I answered, "'go for help,' for I knew well that before he could return with any, more of the roof would have fallen, shutting me in to perish by inches, or perhaps crushing the life out of me in mercy. Then I remembered and added, a Stay a moment before you go. You are noble. I will give you something. I feel here round my neck. There is a little chain. Now draw it over my head, so. You see a token hangs to it. If ever you are in trouble with the Indians, take their chief man apart and show him this, and he will die for you if need be. Englishman, by this gift I have made you heir to the empire of the Aztecs in the heart of every Indian and the master of the great brotherhood of Mexico. Molas the messenger will tell you all and bring you to those who can initiate you. Bid him lead you whither he would have led me. Farewell and God go with you. Tell the Indians how I died that they may not think you have murdered me. To these words of mine the Signor made no answer, but thrust the token into his pocket without looking at it, like one who, who dreams. Then, taking the candle with him, he crept forward down the tunnel and vanished, and my heart sank as I saw him go, leaving me to my dreadful fate without a word of farewell. Oh, doubtless he was too frightened to speak, I thought and it is right that he should fly as quickly as possible to save his life. Now, as I was soon to learn, I was doing the Signor bitter wrong in my mind, seeing that he never dreamed of deserting me, but went to find a means of rescue. As he told me afterwards, when he reached the mouth of the tunnel, he could think of no way by which I might be saved, since these mountains were uninhabited, and it would take several hours to bring men from Kumarvo. Outside the mine he sat himself down to consider what could be done, but no thought came, for it was impossible to use the strength of the horses in that narrow place. Then he sprang up and looked round him in despair. Close to him was a little ravine hollowed by water, and on its very edge grew a small mimosa thorn, of which the long roots had been washed almost bare by flood. He saw it, and an inspiration entered into him. With the help of a lever he might be able to do a feat to which his unaided strength was not equal. 
springing at the little tree that, uh, being of so tough a wood, was the best possible for his purpose, he tore it from such root-hold as remained to it. A few strokes with his heavy hunting knife trimmed off the branches and fibers, and soon he was creeping carefully up the tunnel, dragging the tree after him. When he had gone some twenty paces, he heard another fragment of the roof fall, and so he said in his, in his story, was minded to fly. He had but just escaped from a horrible end, and the end that generations ago overtook the poor Aztec, and it was awful to brave it again. He knew that his chances of being able to rescue me were few indeed, whereas those that he would perish miserably in the attempt were many. Then he remembered what my sufferings must be if I still lived, also how his own convenience would reproach him in the after year should he leave me to my fate, and he went on. Now that he could see that uh, the half-detached mass of roof still hung, it was a smaller fragment which had fallen one nearer to the entrance. He could see also that I lay in the same position beneath the rock, and he thought that I was dead because I neither moved nor spoke, though in fact I had but swooned under the agony of my suffering. "'Are you dead?' he whispered, and I heard his voice through my sleep and lifted my head, looked up at him astonished, for I'd never thought to see him again. "'Do I behold a spirit?' I said, or is it you come back?' It is I, Ignatio, and I have brought a lever. Now, when I lift, struggle forward if you can. Then he placed the trunk of the thorn tree in what seemed to him the best position, and put all his strength upon it. It was in vain, even so he could not stir the rock. Try a little more to the right, I said faintly. There is a better hold. He shifted the lever and dragged at it till his muscles cracked, and I felt the stone tremble as its bulk began to rise. "'If you can help ever so little it will come,' he gasped. Then in my despair, though the anguish of it nearly killed me, I set my palms upon the ground and, contracting myself like a snake that is held with a forked stick, thrust upwards with my back till the point of the stone was raised to the height of eight or ten inches from the ground. For a moment, and one only, it hung there. Next instant the lever slipped, and down it came again. But I had taken my chance, for clinging to the floor with my fingers as soon as my back was free, with a quick movement I dragged myself a foot or more forward. Then the point of the rock that had been lifted from my spine fell again, but this time it struck the ground between my thighs. Now he seized me by the arms and tore me free, though I left one of my long boots beneath the stone. I strove to rise, but could not because of the hurt to my back. "'You must carry me, senor,' I said. He glanced at the mass that trembled above us. Then, giving me the candle, he lifted me from the ground like an infant and staggered forward down the tunnel. Perhaps we had gone some seven or eight paces, not more, when there was a dreadful crash behind us. The roof had fallen in, and the spot which we occupied some thirty seconds ago was now piled high with rocks. On, I said, cracks are showing in the stone above us and he rushed forward till we found ourselves outside the mine. Now I bowed my head and returned thanks for my escape. Then, lifting it, I looked my preserver in the face and said, I swear by the name of God, Senor, that he never made a man nobler than yourself. The next instant I fell forward and fainted there among the ferns. Ten days had passed since I was carried from the mouth of that accursed mine back to Camarvo, in a litter, and during all this time I had suffered much pain in my back, and been very ill, so ill indeed that I was scarcely allowed to speak with any one. Now, however, I was much better, and one afternoon the Signor Strickland, assisted by my foster brother Molas, lifted me from my bed into a hammock. "'By the way, Ignacio,' said the Signor, when Molas had gone, 
I never gave you back that charm of yours. What a strange trinket it is, he added, taking it from his neck. And what did you mean by your talk in the tunnel about its making me heir to the empire of the Aztecs in the heart of every Indian, and the rest of it? I suppose that you were delirious with pain and did not know what you were saying. Is the door shut, senor? I asked. And and are you sure that there is no one on the veranda? Good. Then draw your chair nearer, and I will tell you something. I am not certain that I should take this talisman back again. Still, I will do so for reasons which you shall learn presently. Know, senor, that this broken gem is at once the foundation stone and the secret symbol of a great order of which, although you have not been initiated into it, you are now one of the lords, seeing that the crowning and vital ceremony of the creation of a lord of the hearts consists in the hanging of the symbol about his neck for the space of a minute only by himself, who am the chief lord and keeper of the heart of life and you have worn it for ten whole days. Before we part, I will call a chapter of the order, for even among these mountains we have brethren, and you shall be initiated into its ritual and raised to the rank of a chief lord, as is your right. Meanwhile, I will instruct you briefly in its mysteries, as it is my bounden duty to do. Understand, Signor that the first duty of the servant of the heart is silence, and that silence I demand of you. Men have died ere now, senor, yes, they have died on the rack in the dungeons of the Inquisition, and shriveled as wizards in the fires of the stake, sooner than reveal these things that have been told them upon the faith of the heart, against which the confessional itself cannot prevail, no not with the best of Catholics. But suppose that a man should not keep silence, Ignatio, what then? he asked. There is a land, senor, I answered, where the most talkative grow dumb, and its borders can be crossed by all, even by the lords of the heart, for fearful is the doom of a false brother. You mean that if I repeat anything I may hear... I shall be murdered? Oh, indeed, no, senor. But you may happen to die. I speak on the heart. Do you hear with the ears? I hear with the ears, he answered, catching my meaning. Very well, senor. Since you have now sworn secrecy to me by the most sacred oath that can pass the lips of a man, I will speak to you openly. This is the tale of the broken heart, so far as I know it, though how much of it is truth, and how much legend, I cannot say. You have heard the story of that white man, or God, sometimes called Quetzal by the Indians, and sometimes Chuchumats, who came to these lands in the far past and civilized their peoples? Afterwards he vanished away in a ship, promising that when many generations had passed, he would return again. When he had gone, the empire which he had created fell into the hands of two brothers, whose chief city was either Palenque or its, in its neighborhood, and the citizens of this empire, like we Christians, worshipped one good God, the true God, under the name of heart of heaven, and to him they offered few sacrifices save those of fruit and flowers. Now one of these brothers married a wife from another country, a daughter of devils, very beautiful, and a great witch. Soon this woman, as in the story of the wives of Solomon and their lord, drew away the king, her husband, from the true faith to the worship of the gods of her own land, and brought it about that he offered human sacrifice to them. Then there arose a great confusion in the country, and the end of it was that the people divided themselves into two parties, the worshippers of the heart of heaven and the worshippers of devils. 
they made war upon each other till many of their chief men were killed. Then they came to an agreement whereby the nation was sundered. Half of it, under that king who had married the woman, marched northwards and became the fathers of the Aztecs and other tribes, and half, the faithful worshippers of the heart, remained in the Tabasco country. Now from that day forward evil overtook both these peoples, for though the Aztecs flourished for a while, in the end Spaniards despoiled them. The worshippers of the heart were also driven from their cities by hordes of barbarians who rolled down upon them, and their faith perished, or seemed to perish. But what has this history to do with a charm about your neck, Ignatio? he asked. I will tell you. When Quetzal sailed away from his people, so says the legend, he left the stone that once he had worn upon his brow, of which this is the half, to be a treasure to the kings who came after him. Also he set his fate upon it, that while the heart remained unbroken, for so long should the people be one and whole. But if it came about that it was cut or shattered, they should be divided with it, and no more one people again until the fragments were one stone. Now, when these king brethren quarreled and parted, they sawed the token asunder, as you see, each of them keeping a half, this half being that of him who married the woman. For generations it was worn by his descendants, and upon their deathbeds passed on to them to another, or at times taken from their bodies after they were dead. There are many stories told about the stone in the old days, and it is certain that he who had it was the real king of the country for the time being. At length it came into the hands of the great Guatemoc, last of the Aztec emperors, who, before the Spaniards hung him, found means to send it to his son, from whom it has come down to me. To you? What have you to do with the Guatemoc? I am his lineal descendant, senor, the eleventh in the male line. Then you ought to be emperor of the Indians, if every man has his rights, Ignatio. Oh, that is so, senor. But of my own story I will tell you presently, now of this stone. Through all the ages it has never been lost, and it is known in the land from one end to the other. He who wears it for his life, being called Keeper of the Heart, and also Hope of Those Who Wait, since it may happen in his day that the two halves will come together again. And what if they do? Then, so says the legend, the Indians will once more be a mighty nation and drive those who oppress them into the sea as the wind drives dust. Now the Signor rose from his chair and walked up and down the room. Do you believe all this? he asked suddenly. Yes, I answered, or the greater part of it. Indeed, if what I hear is true, the lost half of the talisman that has been missing for so many generations is in Mexico at this moment, and so soon as I am well enough, I go to seek him who bears it, and who has come from far to find me. That is why we must part, senor. Well, where has this man come from? he asked eagerly. Well, I do not know for certain, I answered, but I think he has come from the sacred city of the Indians, the hidden golden city which the Spaniards sought for but could not find, though it still exists among the mountains and deserts of the far interior, whither I hope to journey with him. That still exists, Ignatio? Oh, you must be mad. It never has existed except in the imagination. You say so, senor, but I think differently. At least I knew a man whose grandfather had seen it. He, the grandfather, was a native of San Juan Batista in Tabasco, and when he was young he committed some crime and fled inland to save his life. All that befell him I do not know, but at length 
he found himself wandering by the shores of a great lake, somewhere in or beyond the country that is now known as Guatemala, and being exhausted he laid himself down to die there and fell asleep. When he awoke, people were standing round him like the Indians to look at, but very light in color and beautifully dressed in white robes, with necklaces of emeralds and feathered capes. These people put him on board a great canoe and took him to a glorious city with a high pyramid in the center of it, which was named Heart of the World. Of this city he saw little, however, for its inhabitants kept him a prisoner. Only from time to time he was brought before their king and elders, who sat in a hall filled with images of dead men fashioned in gold, and there was questioned as to the country whence he came, the tribes that dwelt in it, and more especially of the white men who ruled the land. In that hall alone, so he said, there were more gold and precious stones than are to be found in all Mexico. When he had nothing more to tell them, the people wished to kill him, fearing lest he should escape and bring upon them the white man who loved gold. The end of it was that he did escape by the help of a woman who guided him back towards the sea, though she never came there, for she died upon the road. Afterwards this man went to live in a little village near Palenque, where he also died, having revealed nothing of what he had seen, since he feared lest the vengeance of the people of the heart should follow him. When he was dying he told his son, who told his son, who told the tale to me. Signor, it has been the dream of my life to visit that city, and now at last I think that I have found the clue which will lead me to it. Why do you want to visit it, Ignacio? To understand that, senor, you must know my history. And I told him of the failure of the great plot and of the part I had played in it, all of which I have already set out, also the secret hopes and ambitions of my life. Senor, I added, though I am beaten, I am not yet crushed, and I still desire to build up a great Indian empire. I see by your face that you think me foolish. Well, you may be right, or I may be right. I may be pursuing truths or dreams. I may be sane and a redeemer, or insane and a fool. What does it matter? I follow the light that runs before me. Will o' the wisp or star, it leads to one end, and for me it is the light that I am born to follow. If you believe nothing else, at least believe this, senor, that I do not seek my own good or advancement, but rather that of my people. At the worst, I am not a knave, I am only a fool. But how will you help your cause by visiting the city, supposing it, supposing it does exist, Ignacio? Thus, senor, these people, among whom, without doubt, the old man of whom I have spoken, who is named Zebalbe, is a chief or king, are the true stock and head of all the Indian races, and when they learn my plans and who I am, they will be glad to furnish me with means whereby I can bring them to their former empire. And... If they take another view of the matter, Ignacio, then I fail, that is all. And among so many failures, one more will scarcely matter. I am like a swimmer who sees, or thinks he sees, a single plank that may bear him to safety. Maybe he cannot reach that plank, or if he reach it, maybe it will sink beneath his weight. At least he has no other hope. Signor... I have no other hope. There in the golden city is untold wealth, for the man saw it, and without money, great sums of money, I am helpless. Therefore I go thither to win the money. The ship has foundered under me, and with it the cargo of my ambition and the work of my life. So being desperate, I fall back upon a desperate expedience. First, 
I will seek this man, that the two halves of the heart may come together, and the prophecy be fulfilled. Then, if it may be, I will travel with him to the city heart of the world, careless whether I live or die, but determined, if there is need, to die fighting for the fulfillment of the dream of an Indian empire, Christian regenerated and stretching from sea to sea, that I have followed all my days. The dream, Ignatio, perhaps you name it well. Yet few have such noble dreams. And now who goes with you on this journey? Who goes with me? Molas, so far as the temple where the Indian is. After that, if I proceed, no one. Who would accompany a man grown old and failure, whom even those that love him deem a visionary on such a desperate quest? Why, if I should dare to tell my projects even, men would mock me as children mock an idiot in the street. I go alone, senor, perhaps to die. As regards the dying, Ignatio, of course I can say nothing, since all men must die sooner or later, and the moment and manner of their end is in the hand of providence. But for the rest you shall not make this journey alone, that is, if you care to have me for a companion, for I will accompany you. You, senor? You? Think what it means, the certainty of every sort of danger, the risk of every kind of death, and at the end the probability of failure. It is folly, senor. Ignacio, he answered, I will be frank with you. Notwithstanding all the prophecies about the wonders that are to follow the reuniting of the heart and the messages from the old man in the temple, I think your scheme of building up an Indian empire greater than that which Cortes destroyed as impracticable as it is grand. The time has gone by when it could have been done, or perhaps it has not yet returned. But before the Indians can rule again, they must forget the bitter lessons and the degradation of ages. In short, they must be educated, Ignatio. Still, if you think otherwise, that is your affair. You can only fail, and there are failures more glorious than most successes. Do you understand me? Perfectly, senor. Very well. Now, as regards the search for this golden city, to me the matter seems very vague, since your hopes of finding it are based upon a traveler's tale told by a man who died seventy or eighty years ago, and the chance that a certain person, whom you have not yet seen, has come from there, and is willing to guide you back to it. Still, the prospect of hunting for that city pleases me, for I am an adventurer in my heart. If ever we get further than the forest country in Tabasco, where your friend with the token is waiting for you, our search will probably end in the leaving of our bones to decorate some wilderness or mountain top in the unknown regions of Guatemala. But what of that? I have no chick or child. My death would matter nothing to any living soul. For years I have worked hard with small results. Why should I not follow my natural bent and become an adventurer? I can scarcely do worse than I have done, and I think that the way of life would suit me. That mine you showed me is rich enough, no doubt, but I have no capital to deal with it, and if I had, my experience of the place was such that I never wish to set foot in it again. In short, I am ready to start for Tabasco and the sacred city, or whatever else you like, uh, so soon as you are fit to travel. Do you swear that on the heart, senor? I asked. Oh, by all means, but I should prefer to give you my hand upon it. And he stretched out his hand, which I took. Good. You swear on the heart and give me your hand. The oath is perfect. We are comrades henceforth, senor, 
For my part, I ask no better one. I have nothing more to say. I cannot promise that you will find this city, or that if you find it, it will advantage you. I am an unlucky man, and it is more likely that by yoking yourself with me, you will bring my misfortunes upon your head. This I swear, however, that I will be a true comrade to you, as you were to me in yonder in the mine, and for the rest the adventure must be its own reward. End of chapter 4By H. Ryder Haggard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 The Beginning of the Quest. Something more than a month from the day when the Signor Strickland and I made our compact to search for the secret city of the Indians, we found ourselves together with Molas at Veracruz, waiting for a ship to take us to Frontera, where we proposed to disembark. This port we had chosen in preference to Campeche, although the latter was nearer to the ruins where we hoped to find the Indian Zibalbe, because from it we could travel in canoes up the Grijalva and other rivers unobserved by any save the natives. Things are changed now in these parts, but in those days the white man who lived thereabouts beyond the circle of the towns were too often robbers, as Molas had found to his cost some few weeks before. At Veracruz we purchased such articles as were necessary to our journey, not many, for we could not be sure of finding means to carry them. Among them were hammocks, three guns that would shoot either ball or shot, with ammunition, as many muzzle-loading Colts revolvers, uh, the best that were to be had twenty years ago, some medicines, blankets, boots, and spare clothes. Also we took with us all the money that we possessed, amounting to something over fifteen hundred dollars in gold, which sum we divided between us, carrying it in belts about our middles. At Veracruz, where people are very curious about the business of others, we gave out that Signor Strickland was one of those strange Englishmen who loved to visit old ruins, for which purpose he was traveling to Yucatan, that I, Ignatia, was his guide and companion, and that Molas, my foster brother, was our servant. Now we proposed to leave Veracruz by a fine American vessel, a sailing ship that, after touching at the ports along the coast, traded to Havana in New York. As it chanced, the departure of this ship was delayed for a week, so being pressed for time, and fearing lest we should catch the yellow fever that was raging in the town unhappily for ourselves, we took passage in a Mexican boat called the Santa Maria. She was an old sailing vessel of not more than 250 tons burthen, that had been converted by her owners into a paddle-wheel steamer, with the result that, except in favorable weather, she could neither sail nor steam with any speed or safety. Her business was to trade with passengers and cargo between Veracruz and the ports of Frontera and Campeche. "'Wherefore?' asked the agent of Signor Strickland as he filled in the tickets. Frontera, he answered. Your boat stops there, does she not? Oh, certainly, senor, he said, as he pocketed the dollars. Yet all the while this shameless rogue knew that she had orders to touch at Campeche, which is the furthest port, first, and return to Frontera a week later, but of this more in its place. That afternoon the Santa Maria, with us on board of her, was piloted out of the harbor of Veracruz, and we heard the pilot swearing because she would not answer properly to her helm. Standing by the engines, we noticed also that 
though they had not been working for more than half an hour, it was found necessary to keep a stream of water in constant play upon the bearings. The Signor asked the reason of this of a man who was mate and engineer of the boat, and he answered with a shrug that sand had got into the machinery when she was steaming over a bar of the Grijalva River. He thought, however, that the bearing, should it please the saints, would last this voyage unless they had the bad luck to run into a norther, as you English call, El Norte. The fearful gales that in certain seasons of the year sweep over the Gulf of Mexico. And if we run into a norther, he asked, whereupon the man made a grimace, crossed himself to avert the omen, and vanished down the stokehole. Now we began to feel sorry that we had not taken passage in the American ship, since of late northers had been frequent. But as uh, for good or ill we were on board the Santa Maria, we amused ourselves by studying our fellow passengers. Of these there were several on board, perhaps twenty in all, Mexican landowners and officials returning to their haciendas and native towns after a visit to Veracruz, or the capital, some of them pleasant companions, enough and others not so. Three or four of these gentlemen were accompanied by their wives, but the ladies had already retired to the bunks opening out of the cabin, where, although the sea was quite smooth, they could be heard suffering the pains of sickness. Among the passengers was one, a man of not more than thirty years of age, who particularly attracted our attention because of the gorgeousness of his dress. In appearance he was large, handsome, and coarse, and he had Indian blood in his veins, as was shown by the darkness of his color and the thick black eyebrows that gave a truculent expression to his face. While I was wondering who he might be, Molas made a sign to me to come aside, and said, "'You see yonder man with the silver buttons on his coat? "'He is Don José Moreno, the son of that Don Pedro Moreno, "'who waylaid and robbed me of the nuggets "'which the old Indian gave me for the cost of my journey to find you. I heard at the time that he was away from the hacienda in Veracruz or Mexico, and now doubtless he returns thither. Beware of him, Lord, and bid the Englishman to do the same, for like his father he is a bad man. Then he told me certain things connected with him and his family. While Mollus was talking, a bell had been rung for dinner, but I waited till he had finished before going down. At the door of the cabin I met the captain, a stout man with a face like a full moon and bland smile. Uh, "'What do you seek, senor?' he asked. "'My dinner, senor,' I answered. Uh, "'It shall be sent to you on the deck,' he said, not without confusion. "'I do not wish to be rude, senor, but you know that these Mexicans—' <laughs> I am a Spaniard myself, and do not care, hate to sit at meat with an Indian, so if you insist on coming in, there will be trouble. Now I heard, and though the insult was deep, it was one to which I was accustomed, for in this land which belongs to them and where their fathers ruled, to be an Indian is to be an outcast. Therefore, not wishing to make a stir, I bowed and turned away. Meanwhile, it seems that the Signor Strickland, missing me in the cabin, asked the captain where I was, saying that perhaps I did not know that the meal was ready. "'If you refer to our servant, the Indian,' said the captain, "'I met him at the door and sent him away. Surely the Signor knows that we do not sit at table with these people.' "'Captain,' answered Signor Strickland, if my friend is an Indian, he is as good a gentleman as you or anybody else in this cabin. Moreover, he is paid for the first-class fare and has a right to first-class accommodation. I insist upon a seat being provided for him at my side. As you wish, answered the captain, smiling, for he was a man of peace. Only if he comes there will be trouble. 
Then he ordered the steward to fetch me. Now this steward was an Indian who knew my rank. Therefore, not wishing to offend me by repeating what had passed, he said simply that the captain sent his compliments and begged that I would come down to dinner. The end of it was that I went, though doubtfully, and seeing me in the doorway, the Signor Strickland called to me in a loud voice, saying, "'You are late for dinner, friend, but I have kept your place here by me. Sit down quickly, or the food will be cold.' I bowed to the company and obeyed, and then the trouble commenced, for all present had heard this talk. As I took my seat, the Mexicans began to murmur, and the passenger who was next to me insolently moved his plate and glass away. Now, almost opposite to me, sat Don Jose Moreno, the man of whom Molas had told me. As I took my seat, he consulted hastily with a neighbor on his right, then addressing the captain, said in a loud voice, "'There is some mistake.' It is not usual that Indian dogs should sit at the same table with gentlemen. The captain shrugged his shoulders and answered mildly, Perhaps the senor will settle the question with the English senor on my left. To me it does not matter. I am only a poor sailor and accustomed to every sort of company. Senor Strickland, said Don Jose, be so good as to order your servant to leave the cabin. Senor, he answered, for his temper was quick, I will see you in hell before I do so. Caramba, said the Mexican, laying a hand upon the knife in his belt. You shall pay for that, Englishman. When and how you will, senor, I always pay my debts. Then the captain broke in in a strange way. First he put his hand behind him, and drawing a large pistol from his pocket, he laid it by his plate. Signors both, he said in a soft voice, and with a gentle smile, I am loath to interfere in a quarrel of two esteemed passengers, but though I am only a poor sailor, it is my duty to see that there is no bloodshed on board this vessel. Therefore, much as I regret it, I shall be obliged to shoot dead the first man who draws a weapon. And he cocked the pistol. Now the Mexican scowled, and the Signor Strickland laughed outright, for it was a curious thing to hear a man with the face of a sheep growl and threaten like a wolf. Meanwhile, I had risen, for this insult was more than I could bear. Signors, I said, speaking in Spanish, as I see that my presence is unwelcome to the majority of those here, I hasten to withdraw myself. But before I go, I wish to say something, not by way of boasting, but to justify my friend, the English gentleman, in his action on my behalf. However well-born you may be, my descent is nobler and more ancient than yours and therefore it should be no shame to you to sit at table with me. Least of all should uh, the Don Jose Moreno, whose father is a murderer, a highway robber, a man without shame, and whose mother was a half-breed mestiza slut, dare to be insolent to me, who, as any Indian on board this ship can tell you, am a prince among my own people." Now every eye was fixed on Don Jose. His sallow complexion turned to a whitish green as he listened to my words, and for a moment he sank back in his chair, overcome with rage. Then he sprang up once more, gripping at his knife. "'You dog!' he gasped. "'Let me but come at you, and I'll cut your lying tongue out.' You will do nothing of the sort, Don Jose Moreno, I answered, fixing my eyes upon his face. What I have said of your father is true. More there is a man on board this ship whom not three months since he robbed with violence. If the gentlemen, uh, your companions, would like to hear the story, I can tell it to them. For the rest, I am well able to defend myself. Moreover, this vessel is manned by Indians who know me, and should any harm come to me or my friend, the Signor Strickland, I warn you that you will not reach your home alive. 
Gentlemen, I salute you. And I bowed and left the cabin. Friend, I thank you, I said to the Senor when he came upon the deck after dinner ended. Knowing who I am and seeing how in common with my race I am accustomed to being treated by such hounds as these, can you wonder that I am not fond of Mexicans? No, Ignacio, he answered. But all the same, I advise you to be careful of this Don Jose. He is not a man to kiss the stick that beats him, and he will make an end of you, and me too, for the, that matter, if he can. Do not be afraid, senor, I answered, laughing. Besides the steward and Molas, there are twenty Indians on board, most of them belonging to the tribe that dwells beyond the Campeche, the finest race in Mexico. Two of these men are associates of the heart, and all the rest know my rank and will watch that man day and night so he can never come near us without finding them ready for him. Only we shall do well to sleep on deck and not below. That night we spent wrapped in our serapes upon two coils of rope on the forecastle of the Santa Maria with Mola sleeping close behind us. It was a lovely night, and we whiled away the hours in telling tales to each other of our adventures in past years, and in wonderings as to those that lay before us, till at length, fearing nothing, for we knew that our safety was watched over, we fell asleep, to be awakened by the sudden stoppage of the vessel. The day was on the point of dawn. A beautiful and pearly light lay upon the quiet surface of the sea. Above us the stars still shone faintly in the heavens, but to the east the cloud banks were tinged with pink and violet. We sat up wondering what had happened, and saw the captain wrapped in a dirty blanket, engaged in earnest conversation with the engineer, who wore a still dirtier shirt and nothing else. Hearing that something was wrong, the Signor James went to the captain and asked him why we had stopped. "'Because the engines won't go any more, and there is no wind to sail with,' he answered politely. "'But have no fear, my comrade says that he can mend them up. He has nursed them for years and knows their weak points. "'Certainly there is not much to fear in weather like this,' said the Signor, except delay. "'Nothing, nothing,' replied the captain, glancing anxiously at a narrow black band of cloud that lay on the rim of the horizon beneath the fleecy masses in which the lights of dawn were burning. Uh, "'Do you think that we are likely to have a norther?' asked the Signor in his blunt, white man's way. "'No, no!' exclaimed the captain, crossing himself at the name of that evil power, El Norte. "'But, uh, quien sabe, God makes the weather, not we poor sailors.' Then, with uh, another glance at the threatening line of cloud, he hurried away as though to avoid further conversation. Presently the engines began to work again, though haltingly, like a lame mule, and as the morning drew on the day became clear, and the thin black cloud vanished from the horizon. Towards three o'clock in the afternoon, Molas pointed to a low coastline, and a spot on the sea where the ocean swell showed tipped with white, told us that yonder was the bar of the Grijalva River, and that behind it lay the village of Frontera, our destination. Good, said the Signor, then I think that I will get my things on deck, and going to his cabin he brought up a sack containing some wraps and food. "'Why do you fetch your luggage?' asked the captain presently. "'You may want it to-night.' Uh, "'That is why I brought it up,' he answered. "'I do not wish to land at Frontera with nothing.' "'Land at Frontera, senor? "'No one will land at Frontera from this ship for another six or seven days. "'We pass Frontera and run straight on to Campeche, which... By the blessing of the saints, we shall reach tomorrow evening. But I have taken tickets for Frontera, said the Signor. The agent gave them to me, and I insist upon being put ashore there. Oh, that is quite right, Signor. 
all being well we shall call it frontera this day week and then you can go ashore without extra charge but before this my orders are to put into no port except campeche that is unless a norther forces me to do so may the norther sink you your ship your agents and everything you have to do with answered the senor in so angry a voice that the mexican passengers who were listening began to laugh at the englishman's discomfiture though the more thoughtful of them crossed themselves to avert the evil omen then followed a storm for the senor whose temper as i have said was not of the coolest raged and swore in no measured terms the captain shrugged his shoulders and apologized the passengers smiled and seeing that there was no help for the matter i looked on patiently after the manner of my race at length the captain fled wiping his brows and exclaiming what manner of men are these english that they make such trouble about a little time mother of heaven why are they always in a hurry is not to-morrow as good a day as to-day and better that evening we dined together upon the deck for neither of us were in any good mood to descend to a cabin and meet don jose moreno of whom we had seen nothing since the previous night as we were finishing our meal the light faded and the sky grew curiously dark well suddenly to the north there appeared a rim of cloud similar to that which we had seen on the horizon at dawn but now it was an angry red and glowed like the smoke from a smelting furnace at night the sky looks very strange ignacio said the senor to me and at that moment we heard molas and an indian sailor speaking together in brief words el norte said molas pointing toward the red rim of light see si, el norte answered the sailor as he went towards the cabin presently the captain hurried up the companion ladder and studied the horizon of which the aspect seemed to be frightening him in another minute the mate joined him appearing from the engine hatch and the two of them began to converse or rather to dispute i was sitting near unobserved in the darkness and so far as i could gather the mate was in favor of putting the ship about and running for frontera from which port we were now distant some forty miles on the other hand the captain said that if they did so and the norther came up it would catch them before they got there and wreck them upon the bar of the grijalva river he added that he did not believe there would be any norther and if by ill luck it should come their best course was to stand for the open sea and ride it out the mate answered that this would be an excellent plan if the ship were staunch and the engines could be relied on only he declared loudly that they might as well try to sail a boat with a mast made of cigarettes as to attempt to lie head on the norther with leaking boilers worn-out engines and a strained paddle-wheel after this the discussion grew fierce and as full of oaths as a shark's mouth with teeth but in the end the two sailors determined that their safest plan would be to hold on their present course and, if necessary, round point Excalango and take shelter behind Carmen Island, or, if they could, in the mouth of the Usumcinto River. Then they parted, the captain abjuring the mate to say nothing of the state of the weather to the passengers and above all to that accursed englishman who had called this misfortune upon them because he was not put off at frontera and whose evil eye brought bad luck another two hours passed without much change except that the night grew darker and darker and stiller and yet more still the senor strickland who had been walking up and down the deck smoking a cigar came and sat beside me on a coil of rope and asked me if i thought the norther was coming yes it is coming i answered and i fear that it will sink us at least so say the indian sailors you take the idea of being drowned like a puppy in a sack very coolly ignatio 
How far are we from Point Exclango? About twelve miles, I believe, and I take it coolly, because there is no use in making an outcry. God will protect us if he chooses, and if he chooses he will drown us. It is childish to struggle against destiny. A true Indian creed, Ignatio, he answered. You people sit down and say, it is fate, let us accept it. But one that I and the men of my nation do not believe in. If they had done so, instead of being the first country in the world today, England long ago would have ceased to exist, for many a time she has stood face to face with fate and beaten her. For my part, if I must die, I prefer to die fighting. Tell me, are any of these people to be relied on if it comes to a pinch? Uh, the Indian sailors are Campeche men, and brave. Also, they know the coast, and, if need be, they will do anything that I tell them. For the rest I cannot say, but the captain seems to understand something of his business. Look and listen. As I spoke, a vivid flash of lightning pierced the heavens above us, followed by a deafening peal of thunder. In its fierce and sudden glare we could see the coast some three or four miles away, and almost ahead of us of the bolder outline of Point Excalango. The water about our ship was dead calm, and slipped past her sides like oil. The smoke in the funnel rose almost straight into the air, where at a certain height it twisted round and round, and a sail that had been hoisted flapped to and fro for lack of wind to draw it. A mile or so to windward, however, was a different sight, for there came the norther, rushing upon us like a thing alive. In front of it a line of white billows torn from the quiet surface of the sea, and behind it, fretted by little lightnings, a dense wall of black clouds stretching from the face of the ocean to the arc of heaven. Now the captain who was on deck saw his danger, for if those billows caught us broadside, we would surely founder. In the strange silence that followed the boom of thunder, he shouted to the helmsman to bring the ship head on to the sea, and to the sailors to batten down the after hatch, the only one that remained open, shutting the passengers except ourselves and Molas into the cabin. His orders were obeyed well and quickly. The Santa Maria came around and began to paddle towards the open water and the advancing line of foam. It was terrible to see her, so small a thing, driving on thus into what appeared to be the very jaws of death. Now the unnatural quiet was broken. A low moaning noise thrilled through the air. The waters about the ship's side began to seethe and hiss, and spray flying ahead of the wind cut our faces like the lash of a whip. A few more seconds and something white and enormous could be seen looming above our bows, and the sight of it caused the captain, whose face looked pale as death in the gleam of the lightning, to shriek another order to his crew. "'Lie down and hold on tight to the rope,' I said to Signor Strickland and Molas, who were beside me. "'Here comes El Norte, and he brings death for many of us on board this ship.'" End of chapter 5《H. Ryder Haggard》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 El Norte Another moment and El Norte had come in strength. First a sudden rush of wind struck the vessel, causing her to shiver, and with a sharp report rending from its fastenings the jib, which had not been furled. This gust went howling by, and after it rolled the storm. 
To us it seemed that the Santa Maria dived head first into a huge wave, a level line of white illumined with lightnings and swept forward by the hurricane for in an instant a foot of foaming water tore along her deck from stem to stern, sweeping away everything movable upon it, including two Indian sailors. We should have gone with the rest had we not clung with all our strength to the rope coiled about the foremast, but as it was we escaped with a wetting. For a while the ship stood quite still, and it seemed as though she were being pressed into the deep by the weight of water on her decks, but as this fell from her in cataracts she rose again and ploughed forward. Fortunately, the first burst of the tempest was also the most terrible, and it had not taken her broadside on, for the one or two more of such waves would have swamped us. After it had passed shorewards, driven by the hurricane wind, for a little space there was what by comparison might be called a lull. Then the Santa Maria met the full weight of the norther. For a while she forged ahead against the shrieking wind and the vast succeeding seas, shipping such a quantity of water that presently the captain found it necessary to reduce her engines to half speed, which it was hoped would suffice to give her way without filling her. Now less water came aboard, but on the other hand, as was soon evident, the vessel began to drift towards the point Excalango, and from this moment it became clear that only a miracle could save her. For an hour or more the Santa Maria kept up a gallant and unequal fight, being constantly pressed backwards by the might of the storm, till at length we could see in the glare of the lightning that the breakers of the point were raging not two hundred paces from her stern. The captain saw them also and made a last effort, shifting the vessel's bow a little so that the sea struck her on the port quarter. He gave the order of full steam ahead, and once more we drove forward. Before and since that day I have made many voyages across the Gulf of Mexico in all weathers, but never have I met with such an experience as that which followed. The ship plunged and strained and rocked, lifting now her bow and now her stern high above the waves till it seemed as though she must fall to pieces while water in tons rushed aboard her at every dip which as she righted herself streamed through the broken bulwarks slowly very slowly we were forging away from the point and out into the channel which lies between it and carmen island but the effort was too fierce to last Presently, after a succession of terrible pitchings, one paddle-wheel suddenly ceased to thrash the water, while the other broke to pieces, and a faint cry from below told those on deck that the worn-out machinery had collapsed. Now we were in the mid-race, or channel, through which the boiling current, driven by the fury of the gale and the push of the tide, tore at a speed of fifteen or sixteen knots, carrying the Santa Maria along with it as a chip of wood is carried down a flooded gutter. Twice she hurled right round, for now that her machinery had gone, there was no power to keep her head to the waves, and on the second occasion, as she lay broadside to them, a green sea came aboard of her that swept her decks almost clean, taking away with it every boat except the cutter, which fortunately was slung upon davits to starboard and out of its reach. Crouching under shelter of the mast again, the three of us clung to our rope, nor did we leave to go, although the water ground us against the deck, covering us for so long that before our heads were clear of it, we felt as though our lungs must burst. As it chanced, what remained of the starboard bulwarks was carried away by the rush, allowing the sea to escape, or the ship must have foundered at once. But it had done its work for the engine-room hatchway and the engine-light were stove-in, and the Santa Maria was half full of water. 
before a second sea could strike her her nose swung round and in this position she was washed along the race her deck not standing more than four feet above the level of the waves now from time to time the moon shone out between rifts in the storm clouds revealing a dreadful scene fragments of the little bridge still remained and to them was lashed the large body of the captain in an upright position though as he neither spoke nor stirred we never learned whether he was only paralyzed by terror or had been killed by a blow from the funnel as it fell you will remember my friend that he had ordered the passengers to be battered down and there in the cabin they remained twenty or more of them until the hatchways were stove in then with the exception of one or two who were drowned by the water that poured down upon them they rushed up the companion men and women together for they could no longer stay below and shrieking praying and blaspheming clung to fragments of the bulwarks shrouds of the mast or anything which they thought could give them protection against the pitiless waves awful were the wails of the women who clad only in their night dresses now quitted their bunks for the first time since they entered them in the harbour of veracruz overcome by fear and having no knowledge of the dangers of the deep these poor creatures flung themselves at full length upon the deck striving to keep hold on the slippery boards whence one by one they rolled into the ocean as the vessel lurched or were carried away by the seas that pooped her some of the men followed them to their watery grave others more self-possessed crept forward attempting to escape the waves that broke over the stern but none made any effort to save them indeed it would have been impossible so to do among those who crawled forward to where we and some of the indian sailors were clinging to the rope that was coiled round the stump of the broken foremast was don jose moreno even in his terror which was great this man could still be ferocious for recognizing the senor he yelled ah maldonado evil gifted one you called down the norther upon us well at least you shall die with the rest suddenly drawing his long knife he rose to his knees and holding the rope with one hand attempted to drive it into the senor's body with the other doubtless he would have succeeded in his wickedness had not an indian boatswain who was near bent forward and struck him so sharply on the arm with his clenched fist that the knife flew from his hand trying to recover it don jose fell face downwards on the deck where he lay making no further effort at aggression afterwards the senor told me such was the horror and the confusion of the scene that at the time he scarcely noticed this incident though every detail came back to him on the morrow and with it a great wonder that even when death was staring them in the face the indians did not forget their promise to watch over our safety meanwhile swept onward by the tide and gale the santa maria waterlogged and sinking rushed swiftly to her doom our last hour was upon us and for a space this knowledge seemed to be numb the mind of the senor strickland who crouched at my side as the wet and the cold had benumbed his body nor was this strange for it seemed terrible to perish thus can we do nothing he said to me at length ask the indians if there is any hope putting my face close to the ear of the boatswain i spoke to him then shouted back he says that the current is taking us round the point of the island, and if the ship weathers it, we shall come presently into calmer water, where a boat might live. If there is one left and it can be launched, he thinks, however, that we must sink. When the Signor heard this, he hid his face in his hands, and doubtless began to say his prayers, as I did also soon however we ceased even from that effort for we were rounding the point and once more the seas were breaking on and over the vessel's sides for a few minutes there was a turmoil that cannot be described 
Then, although the wind still shrieked overhead, we felt that we were in water which seemed almost calm to us. The ship no longer pitched and rolled, she only rocked as she settled before sinking, while the moon, shining out between the clouds, showed that what had been her bulwarks were not more than two or three feet above the level of the sea. Six Indians, our three selves, Don Jose, who seemed to be senseless, and the body of the captain lashed to the broken bridge alone remained of the crew and passengers of the Santa Maria. The rest had been swept away, but there close to us the cutter still hung upon the divots. The Senor saw it, and I think he remembered his saying of a few hours before that he would die fighting. At least, he cried, The ship is sinking! To the boat, quick! And running to the center, he climbed into her, as did I, Molas, and the six Indian sailors. She was full of water almost to the thwarts, which could only be got rid of by pulling out the wooden plug in her bottom. Happily the boatswain, and the same man who had struck the knife from the hand of Don Jose, knew where to look for this plug, and, being a sailor of courage and resource, he was able to loose it, so that presently the water was pouring from her in a stream thick as a hawser. Meanwhile, urged to it by the hope of escape, the other Indians were employed in getting out the oars, and in loosening the tackles before slipping them together, when enough water had run out to allow the boat to swim. "'Get the plug back,' said the Senor. "'The vessel is sinking. You must bail the rest.' Half a minute more, and it was done. Then, at a word from the boatswain, the sailors lowered away, and they had not far to go, and we were afloat, and, better still, quite clear of the ship. Scarcely had they brought the head of the cutter round and pulled three or four strokes, when from the deck of the Santa Maria there came the sound of a man's voice, crying for help. By the light of the moon we discovered the figure of Don Jose Moreno, clinging to the broken bulwarks that now were almost awash. "'For the love of God, come back to me!' he screamed. The oarsman hesitated, but the boatswain said with an Indian oath, "'Pull on and let the dog drown!' It seemed as if Don Jose heard him. At least he raised so piteous a wailing that the Senor's heart, which was always over-tender, was touched by it. "'We cannot desert the man,' he answered. "'Put back for him!' "'He tried to murder you just now,' shouted the boatswain. "'and if we go near the ship, she will take us down with her.' "'Then he turned to me and asked, "'Do you command us to put back, Lord?' "'Since the Senor wills it, I command you,' I answered. "'We must save the man and take our chance.' "'He commands whom we must obey,' shouted the boatswain again. "'Put back, my brothers.' "'Sullenly but submissively the Indians backed water "'till they lay almost beneath the counter of the vessel "'that wallowed in the trough of the swell before she went down. "'On deck, clinging to the stays of the master, Don Jose, "'his straight-oiled hair beat about his face. "'His gorgeous dress was soaked and disordered. "'Save me!' he yelled hoarsely. "'Save me! "'Throw yourself into the sea, senor, and we will pick you up. I dare not, was the answer. Come aboard and fetch me. Does the Senor still wish us to stay? asked the boatswain calmly. Listen, you cur, shouted the Senor. The ship is sinking, and will take us with it. At the word uh, three, give way, men. Now will you come or not? One, two... "'I come!' said the Mexican, and, driven to it by despair, he cast himself into the sea. With difficulty the seigneur, assisted by an Indian with a boat-hook, succeeded in getting hold of him as he was washed past on the swell. I confess that I would have no hand in the affair, since may I be forgiven the sin. My charity was not true enough to make me wish to save this villain.' There, however, the matter rested for the present, as they could not stop to pull him into the boat, for just then the deck of the Santa Maria burst with a rending sound, and she began to go down bodily. "'Row for your lives!' shouted the boatswain, and they rowed, dragging Don Jose in the wake of the cutter. Down went the Santa Maria, bow first, 
making a hollow in the sea that sucked us backwards toward her. For a moment the issue hung doubtful, for the whirlpool caused by the vanished vessel was strong and almost engulfed us, but in the end the stout arms of the Indians conquered and drew our boat clear. So soon as this great danger had gone by, the sailors with much labor lifted Don Jose into the cutter, where he lay gasping but unharmed. Then arose the question of what we could possibly do to save our lives. We were lying under the lee of Carmen Island, which sheltered us somewhat from the fury of the norther, and we might either try to land upon this island, or to put about and run for the mouth of the Usumacinto River. There was a third course, to keep the boat's head to the seas, if that were possible, and let her drift till daylight. In the end, this was what, was what we determined to do. Indeed, while we were discussing the question, it was settled for us, for suddenly the rain began to fall in torrents, blotting out such moonlight as there was, and to land in this darkness would have been impossible, even if the nature of the beach allowed of it. Therefore we lay and gave our thoughts and strength to the task of preventing the waves, which became more and more formidable as we drifted beyond the shelter of the island, from swamping or oversetting us. It was a great struggle, and had it not been that the heavy rain beat down the seas, we could never have lived till morning. As it was, we must have been swamped many times over, but for the staunchness of the boat, which fortunately was a new one, and the seamanship and the ceaseless vigilance of the Indian boatswain who commanded her. For hour after hour he crouched in the bow of the cutter, staring through the sheets of rain and the darkness with his hawk-like eyes and shouting directions to the crew as he heard or caught sight of a white-crested billow rolling down upon us that presently would fling us upwards and sink down into a trough on its furthest side sometimes half filling the boat with water which must be bailed out before the next sea overtook us Afterwards the Seigneur told me that, knowing it to be the nature of Indians to submit to evil rather than to struggle against it, he wondered how it came about that these men faced the fight so gallantly, instead of throwing down their oars and suffering themselves to be drowned. I also was somewhat astonished, till presently the matter was explained, for once, when a larger sea than than those that went before had almost filled us, the boatswain called out to his companion, be brave, my brothers, and fear nothing. The keeper of the heart is with us, and death will flee him. To the Signor, however, the, this comfort seemed cold, since he did not believe that any talisman could save us from the powers of the sky and sea, nor indeed did I. Wet and half frozen as he was, his nerve broken by the terrible scenes we had witnessed upon the lost ship, and by thoughts of the many who had gone down with her, his spirit, so he told, so he told me, failed him at last. He gave no outward sign of his inward state, indeed. He did not follow the example of the Mexican, who lay in the water at the bottom of the boat, groaning, weeping, and confessing his sins, which seemed to be many. Only he sat still and silent, and surrendering, surrendered himself to destiny, till by degrees his forces, mental and bodily, deserted him, and he sank into a torpor. It was little wonder, for rarely have shipwrecked men been in a more helpless position. The blinding rain, the bewildering darkness, the roaring wind and sea, all combined to destroy us while we drifted in our frail craft we knew not whither. As minute after minute of that endless night went by, our escape seemed to become more impossible, for each took with it something of the strength and mental energy of those who fought so bravely against the doom which overshadowed us. For my part, I was sure that my hour had come, but this did not trouble me overmuch, since my life had not been so happy or successful that I grieved at the thought of losing it. Moreover, ever since I became a man, it has been my daily endeavor to prepare my mind for death, and so to live that I should not have to fear the hour of his coming. 
In truth, it seems to me that without such preparation, the life of any man who thinks must be one long wretchedness, seeing that at the last, strive as he may, fate will overtake him, and that there is no event in our lives which can compare in importance to the inevitable end. We live not to escape from death, but in order that we may die. This is the great issue and object of our existence. Still, death is terrible, more especially when we are called upon to wait him hour upon hour amid the horror and turmoil of shipwreck. Therefore I was very thankful when, having flung my serapi about the form of my friend, at length I also was overcome by cold and exhaustion. After a space of time in which the present seemed to fade from me, taking with it all fears and hopes of the future, and the past alone possessed me, peopled by the dead, I sank into unconsciousness or swoon. How long I remained in this merciful state of oblivion I do not know, but I was roused from it by Molas, who shook me and called into my ear with a voice that trembled with cold or joy or both. Awake! Awake! We are saved. Saved? I said confusedly. What from? From death in the sea. Look, Lord. Then with much pain, for the salt spray had congealed upon my face like frost, I opened my eyes to find that the morning was an hour old, and though the skies were still leaden, we were no longer at sea, but floated on the waters of a river, wherefore the bar roared behind us. Where are we? I asked. In the Usumacinto River, thanks be to God, answered Molas. We have been driven across the bay in the dark, and at dawn found ourselves just outside the breakers. Somehow we passed them safely, and there before us is the blessed land. I looked at the bank of the river, clothed with reeds and grasses, and the noble palm trees that grew among them. Then I looked at my companions. The Signor Strickland lay as though he were dead beneath the serapi that I had thrown over him, his head resting on the thwarts. But the Mexican Don Jose was sitting up in the bottom of the boat and staring wildly at the shore. As for the Indians, the men to whom we owed our lives, they were utterly worn out. Two of them appeared to have swooned where they sat, and I saw that their hands were bleeding from the friction of the oars. The others lay gasping beneath the seats, but Molas held the tiller at my side, and the boatswain still sat upright in the bow, where he had faced death for so many dreadful hours. "'Say, Lord,' he asked, turning his face that was hollow with suspense and suffering and white with encrusted salt, to speak to me, "'Can you row? If so, take the oars and pull us to the bank, while Molas steers, for our arms will work no more.' Then I struggled from my seat, and with great efforts, for every movement caused me pain, I pulled the cutter to the bank, and, as her bow struck against it, the sun broke through the thinning clouds. So soon as the boat was made fast, Molas and I lifted the Signor from her, and laying him on the bank, we removed his clothes so that the sun might play upon his limbs, which were blue with cold. As the clouds melted and the warmth increased, I saw the blood begin to creep beneath the whiteness of his skin, which was drawn with the wet and wind, and rejoiced. For now I knew that he did but sleep, and that the tide of life was rising in his veins again, as in my own. While we sat thus warming ourselves in the sunlight, some Indians appeared, belonging to a rancho or village, half a league away. On learning our misfortunes and who we were, these men hurried home to bring us food, having first pointed out to us a pool of sweet rain-water, of which we stood in great need, for our throats were dry. When they had been gone nearly an hour, the Signor woke and asked for drink, which I gave him, in the bailing bowl. Next he inquired where we were and what had happened to us. When I had told him, he hid his face in his hands for a while, then lifted it and said, I am a fool and a boaster, Ignatio. I said that I would die fighting, and it is these men who have fought and saved my life while I swooned like a child. 
I did the same, senor, I answered. Only those who were working at the oars could keep their senses for labor warmed them somewhat. Come to the river and wash, for now your clothes are dry again. And throwing the serape over his shoulders, I led him to the water. As we climbed down the bank, we met the boatswain, and the senor said, holding out his hand to him, You are a brave man, and you have saved all our lives. No, senor, not I, answered the Indian. You forget that with, that with us the keeper of the heart, and the heart that has endured so long cannot be lost. This we knew, and therefore we labored on, well assured that our toil would not be in vain. I shall soon believe in that talisman of yours myself, Ignacio, said the senor, shrugging his shoulders. Certainly it did us good service last night. Then he washed. By the time he had dressed himself, women arrived from the rancho, bearing with them baskets laden with tortillas and meal cakes, frijoli beans and roast kid, and a bottle of good agua ardiente, the brandy of this country. On these provisions we fell to, thankfully, and before we had finished our meal, the alcalde, or head man of the village, presented himself to pay his respects and invite us to his house. Now I whispered to Molas, who had some acquaintance with this man, to take him apart and discover my rank to him, and to learn if perchance he had any tidings of that stranger whom we came to visit, the doctor Zibalbe. He nodded and obeyed, and after a while I rose and followed him behind some trees, where the alcalde, who was of our brotherhood, greeted me with reverence. "'I have news, my lord,' said Molas. "'This man says that he has heard of an old Indian and his daughter. But this morning one who has travelled down the river told him how some five or six days ago they were both of them seized by Don Pedro Moreno, the father of Don José Yonder, and imprisoned at the Hacienda of Santa Cruz, where, dead or alive, they remain. Now I thought a while. Then, sending for Señor James, I told him what we had learned. But what can this villain want to do with an old Indian and his daughter? he asked. The Señor forgets, said Molas, that Don Pedro robbed me of the gold which the doctor gave me, and that in my folly... I told him from whom it came. Doubtless he thinks to win the secret of the mine whence it was dug, and of the mint where it was stamped with the sign of the heart. Also there is the daughter, whom some men might value above all the gold in Mexico. Now, Lord, I fear that your journey is fruitless, since those who become Don Pedro's guests are apt to stay with him forever." "'That I think we must risk,' said the Signor. "'Yes,' I answered. "'Having come so far to find this stranger, "'we cannot turn back now. "'At least we have lived through the worse dangers "'than those that await us at Santa Cruz.'" End of chapter 6